Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, pathological um, cardiac hypertrophy. Okay, so we're just having a brief discussion, which isn't so brief anymore, of uh, what the, um, how the sympathetic nervous system activates uh, the uh, cardiomyocytes to contract more powerfully, i.e. how it has a positive inotropic effect. So we're talking about this type 2 ryanodine receptor here, which is in turquoise. And basically, this is complexed with two other proteins known as triadin and junctin, which are both also linked with the protein cal uh, calcequestrin. So here are two other proteins, which I'll draw like this. So one of these represents triadin, so I'll have this one representing triadin and the other represents another protein called junctin. And these are both bound with the um, type 2 ranadine receptor. So we'll have junctin in red, triadin in orange. Okay, and both junctin and triadin also bind to another protein known as calcequestrin. So both of these also bind to another protein which we'll have here, which is called calcequestrin, which I'll have in blue. Okay, and calcequestrin then binds to calcium. So this blue protein here, this is calcequestrin. Okay, ooh, calcequestrin, there we go. Okay, often abbreviated to CSQ for short. Right, so calcequestrin is bound to calcium, and this keeps lots of calcium nice and close to the uh, type 2 ryanodine receptor. So, when uh, the type 2 ranadine receptor is activated to open by uh, the calcium that's come in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, it's going to release calcium from the SR lumen into uh, the dyadic cleft, okay? So you get a release of calcium from the type 2 ranadine receptor, and that rise in calcium as a result of release from the SR is what's known as a calcium spark. So the signal that came from the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel was a calcium spark alert, and the signal that comes from the uh, type 2 ranadine receptor was a calcium spark. In addition, you also get a reduction in the level of calcium on the intracellular aspect of this type 2 ranadine receptor, and the decrease in calcium in the lumen of the SR is what's known as a calcium scrap, okay? And that's just the uh, park bit spelt backwards. So calcium S scrap, so it's park spelt backwards, giving you this crap. Okay, right. Uh, so um, what then happens is you get this release of calcium from the lumen of the SR, and this is what then leads to most of this spike that we see in the calcium level here, or at least the upstroke of this, um, this calcium spike here. Okay, so very little of that will be contributed by the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. The calcium that comes in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel is really there to cause the release of calcium from the SR via the um, type 2 ranadine receptor. Okay, now, it's this calcium that will then cause the contraction of uh, the cardiac muscle cell. Okay, so that's how we get the upstroke of this calcium spike. Uh, now let's discuss how we get the downstroke. So, uh, calcium has a peculiar effect on the type 2 ranadine receptor. At low levels of calcium, such as the calcium levels that get across the dyadic cleft from the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel to it, uh, it's activated to open, okay? So that's how we got excitation contraction coupling. Okay, but when the calcium level around it gets too high, gets very, very high, as it will when the uh, L sorry, the type 2 ranadine receptor is releasing this calcium from the SR, the calcium in the cytoplasm around the type 2 ranadine receptor will get quite high following that, and it will start negatively feeding back on the type 2 ranadine receptor, so it will start inhibiting it. So, Low levels of calcium activate this to open, high levels of calcium cause it to close. So what will happen is the type 2 ranadine receptors will close. 
In addition, uh, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels will also start to close. The action potential will pass, but more importantly than that, uh, the L-type voltage-gated ca calcium channels will inactivate after a certain period of time. So these will start to close as well. So both of these two channels are closing now. So you're not getting any more calcium coming in from the uh, extracellular space. You're not getting any calcium released from the SR. So now that stopped the calcium going up any further, but how do we actually take it down? Well, there is a pump in the membrane of the SR. Okay, so this pump here in blue here, known as the circa pump. Okay, so this is the circa pump. I'll write its name over here. Circa. And circa stands for the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. Okay, sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. And the job of this pump is to actively transport calcium back into the lumen of the SR. Okay, right. So, it pumps, if I draw it again out here, so this is this pump, just drawn bigger, I've d taken it right out and brought it here. It pumps two calcium ions back into the lumen of the SR in exchange for free protons coming out of the lumen of the SR. In addition, where every time it does this, it has to break down adenosine triphosphate into adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate molecule. So it has to hydrolyze ATP in order to do this um, active transport. However, it is returning the calcium into the SR. So you've shut down both of the methods that were rise, raising the levels of calcium, and the method for returning it back into the SR is gradually working. And that will uh, lead to the decline of the calcium-6 spike. Okay, now it's very, very important, I must stress this, that you get the decline. You must, must have calcium spikes to get an effective uh, force generation within your cardiomyocyte. If you just had continuously high calcium, what would happen? Well, all the sarcomeres in the cardiomyocyte would completely contract up, and then once they were all completely contracted, Okay, the cell would be completely contracted. Would it then be capable of contracting anymore? Okay, no, it's got to the smallest size it can. All of the sarcomeres now are completely contracted. So if I draw a sarcomere, it'll look like this. So here are the actin filaments on the M disc. Here's another sarcomere over here with the actin filaments and an M disc. And now here's the, sorry, these are Z discs, not M discs. The actin attaches to Z discs. Here is the M disc with the myosin filaments attached here. So let me color code this in. So the actin filaments are in green here. Okay. The myosin filaments are in blue here. And you can see that the myosin filaments are at the as far as they can go, basically. They can't get any further. They have climbed right the way up to these Z discs here. So they can't get anywhere beyond that. And then you've got the M disc right in the middle there. So basically, if calcium just stayed high, you would just have your cardiomyocyte contracted continuously. And would it be capable of generating any force in this position? Absolutely not. It wouldn't be doing any work at all. So, what you need to do is you need to have calcium going up where your cardiomyocyte goes to this completely contracted state. Okay, so it goes to this. But then you need to have calcium going down so that all of the sarcomeres can now relax back out and it can return to the relaxed state. Sorry, you can't see this. It can return to the relaxed state and then it's ready to contract again when calcium goes back up and generate more force. So in order to get the maximal work out of the heart, what you need to do is contract and then relax. Uh, it's very important then that you take the calcium back down. So how do you uh, increase um, how do you increase the force which the heart contracts? Well, it, the answer is simple. You elevate the size of these calcium spikes. If the calcium spike were bigger, so if it went up to something maybe like 
this, then what would happen? Uh, you would have more calcium coming into, the, well, in the cytoplasm of the cell, and that would lead to a recruitment of a greater number of sarcomeres within the cardiomyocyte. So more sarcomeres would be activated to contract. So the overall force you generate would be greater. But again, it's very important that if you're going to increase the size of this spike, that you also actually completely take it back down to this low level so that the calcium, uh, sorry, so that the cardiomyocyte can then relax. If you don't do this, you're overall going to uh, reduce the ability of the heart to generate force. Because if the calcium remains high, you just keep sarcomeres continuously contracted and uh, they aren't then capable of actually generating any force. So you need to get complete relaxation and to do that you need to take calcium levels down to almost zero, 100 nanomolars around there. Okay, right. So, how does stimulating the beta-1 receptor raise the level of this calcium spike? Well, basically, these cyclic AMP oscillations are going to uh, activate protein kinase A. Okay, so when the cyclic AMP is high, what's going to happen is you're, it's going to activate protein kinase A enzymes, and the protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, the type 2 ranadine receptors, and also the circa pump. So, when cyclic AMP is high, it activates all three of these apparatus here, is here. So they're going to activate the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, the type 2 ranadine receptor, and the circa pump. Okay, now what is the effect of activating all three of those players? Well, look at these oscillations. When will you actually be activating them? You'll be activating all three of them just before you're about to get a calcium spike, okay? So you activate them all here, and that's the moment just before the calcium spike comes in. So they're all going to be activated just when you're about to do the calcium spike. Now, when you phosphorylate the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel and the type 2 ranadine receptor, it increases their conductance. So this cyclic AMP is going to activate protein kinase A, PKA, which is then going to phosphorylate the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel and the type 2 ranadine receptor, increasing their conductances. So the size of the calcium spark that will go up, that means it will activate more type 2 ranadine receptors in the SR membrane. And also, when these type 2 ranadine receptors are opened, they will have a greater conductance. So each one of the calcium sparks they produce is also going to be greater. So overall, you're going to get more calcium being released into the cytoplasm. And that's what causes uh, this spike to go up. Okay. In addition, um, what you're going to do is the phosphorylation of the type 2 ranadine receptor will also uh, raise the threshold for its inactivation. So you remember I told you that calcium has this dual role. It activates the type 2 ranadine receptor at low concentrations, but then inactivates it at high concentrations. So if you want to get higher levels of calcium, you're going to have to raise the threshold for this type 2 ranadine receptor to be inhibited. So that's the other role of the phosphorylation. It's going to raise the threshold for the inhibition of this type 2 ranadine receptor. Uh, you're going to have to take calcium to a higher level to um, cause it, for it to actually start inhibiting the type 2 ranadine receptor. Okay, in addition, protein kinase A will phosphorylate the circa pump and activate it. Now that's very important because if you don't do that, then um, you won't be able to cope with this higher release of calcium. So we've just discussed how uh, the phosphorylation of the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel and the type 2 ranadine receptor is going to activate um, the release of calcium from the SR. So the release of calcium from the SR is going to be greater. But now if you've released more calcium, you have to then return more calcium into the SR. Uh, you have to, in order to take calcium back down to this low level and allow complete relaxation. So you need to also activate the mechanisms by which calcium is going to be reuptaken. And that's the function of phosphorylating the circa pump. 
In addition, protein kinase A has one final function, which I'll just mention now. It's also going to phosphorylate uh, troponin I on the sarcomeres. So basically, the way that calcium activates uh, the contraction of a sarcomere is that it binds to a troponin protein. So let me just draw this here. So this is an actin filament. This line is meant to represent an actin filament. And when the cardiomyocyte is at rest, the actin filament has a tropomyosin protein wrapped around it. So this represents a tropomyosin protein wrapped around this actin filament in green here. So this is an actin, whoops, that's the actin filament in green. Okay, and around it you have a tropomyosin protein wrapped around it, and this tropomyosin protein stops uh, the myosin filaments from being able to interact with the actin filaments. So this is a tropomyosin protein. Okay, now when uh, calcium goes up in the cytoplasm of the cell, it's going to bind to a protein that holds the tropomyosin to the actin. So the protein which holds tropomyosin to actin is actually a complex of three proteins. So I'll show it here. One, two, three. And this is the troponin protein complex. So this is troponin protein complex, and it consists of three separate proteins, troponin T, troponin C, and troponin I. So the troponin molecule that is closest to the tropomyosin, this one up here, this is troponin T, and it's called troponin T because the T is for tropomyosin. So troponin T is this protein here, which I've put now in bright purple. Okay, and we'll call it here for this video, but we'll continue our discussion in the next video.